For thousands of years, people have sailed the waters of Lake Titicaca between what is now Peru and Bolivia. And they've used vessels like these, crafted from dried bundles of totoro reed. But could reed boats like these have carried ancient sailors across oceans? Phil Buck thinks so. He believes they played a critical role in human migration. Phil's an explorer. Some people call him a modern-day Tor Heyerdahl. He thinks as early as 1,500 years ago, people migrated from South America to settle in Polynesia. And as they traveled, they influenced art, agriculture, civilization itself. It's not a popular theory. And like Heyerdahl before him, Phil is trying to prove it. Easter Island is the central hub of the controversy of who came to Polynesia, who settled Polynesia first. Heyerdahl believed that pre-Columbian cultures of the South American continent traveled vast distances over the ocean to settle on Eastern Island. Even Thor Heyerdahl himself hadn't sailed a primitive vessel from any coast to Easter Island, and no one had up to that point sailed any primitive type of reed ship or balsa raft from the coast of South America. In April of 2000, he became the first modern mariner to sail an ancient-style reed ship from South America to Easter Island, a trip of more than 2,500 miles across the Pacific Ocean. But he wants to go further. We're trying to span the Pacific by going from South America all the way to Australia, continent to continent, via Easter Island, Tahiti, Fiji, and our final destination is Sydney, Australia. It's a distance of nearly 10,000 miles. But first, he has to supervise the construction of the 64-foot hull. It's uh, an interesting vessel because it's a wash-through vessel, so the seas will roll over it and through it and filter down and filter out. There's no hull where we could hit a whale or something that would puncture it and we would go down in minutes. But it does slowly sink. It's a boat that won't sink quickly, but it will eventually sink if you leave it in the water. It's absorbing water. It's getting heavier. These types of vessels could go six months, two months, depending on how it's made. The art of reed boat building has been passed down through the generations. Today it's practiced by only a few craftspeople, most of them living on the shores of Lake Titicaca. The Qatari and Lamachi families built Phil's first boat, and they'll build the new one too. This is a Totora reed, and I need about two million to build our next reed boat to cross the Pacific. Just a few, few reeds, not many. Totora reeds are found around the world. They're everywhere along the shores of Lake Titicaca. Totora has been harvested along this lake perhaps for as long as there have been people living here. Most of the harvesting is still done using traditional tools and methods. The Aymara Indians that live around the lake still retain this craft thousands of years after it was invented, or perhaps more. No one really knows where this uh, design came from. Yeah, it's, it's a very versatile uh, type of plant. Here I'm floating on reeds right now as a floor, and they also use it as a housing material, um, making their housing out of it. It's a very interesting and also uh, feed for cattle as well as making reed boats. These islands have been here for hundreds of years and today are supported more by tourism money than by real sustenance from the water. However, on these islands you can find schools, homes, 
even a small Catholic church. Yes, this is a, um, several generations of people have lived on these particular islands and they keep laying new reeds on top to, uh, to build their housing. You can see it behind me around here. This is all made out of totora reed. Fascinating place. It is just this floating ability of the totora reed that Bach is placing his faith in during his voyage across the Pacific Ocean. So right now we're positioning the boat to cut some reeds to check the quality. Um, we're in the middle of the lake right now, so um, right on a, around some islands, and uh, we're checking the quality. I'm a little concerned about the all the um, uh, spots on the on the uh, the reeds. He said it's from being very cold. He said normally the reeds are cut for harvesting twice a year, and uh, once in August and once in January. These are some of the reed, uh, reed cutters that are down below us here. But uh, when we first pulled into the, into the dock here and walked up on land, she came up to both me and the cameraman, Tom, and uh, said, Viracocha, which means uh, the god of the sun. It also means white person, because the Viracocha uh, legend has it that the, a white god came and taught them civilization. and. Uh, any white person that comes along is called Viracocha. Right now I'm sitting next to the building of the reed bundles. These are the majority of the boat is right behind me. And they're making the last two bundles right on the side of me. Um, pretty exciting. They've been working two months on this. And uh, 60 bundles right here. Um, basically this will make up the majority of the boat. For Phil Buck, it all started with a childhood dream. He read Thor Heyerdahl's Kontiki about six men and their South Pacific balsa raft adventure in 1947. It was so gripping that I never really have gotten off the adventure kick since I've read that book. It was just so inspiring and I thought one day I would like to do a, a trip similar to that. It's thought to be one of the most daring and greatest adventures of all time. It opened up new horizons in the study of human migration, asking if it might have been possible for pre-Columbian mariners to migrate westward from the South American continent to Polynesia. The most controversial theory was that these ancient mariners might have populated one of the most mysterious of all places, Easter Island. Thirty years after reading Heyerdahl's account of his legendary adventure, Buck is embarking on a five-stage circumnavigation of the globe using only ancient-style Totoro reed ships. From Viña del Mar, Chile, Buck and his crew will attempt to sail to Sydney, Australia, a voyage expected to take six months. Viracocha 2 weighs well over 20 tons. Most think it would sink like a rock, but this expedition is trying to prove that reed vessels are the most buoyant and reliable vessels ever made. Wow. 
Since November, crews have worked to complete all the pieces of the puzzle, using only traditional materials, wood and fibers, that the ancient pre-Columbian civilizations would have used some 500 to 1500 years ago. We really need more shovels to lean on, Phil. I wish you'd get some. But coffee breaks, do we need more of those? Huh? Coffee breaks? Life is one big coffee break here on the rear culture. Buck had hoped to launch the ship on February 20. Now, on March 4th, several weeks late, the ship is finally ready to be launched into the Pacific. Un, dos, tres. Un, dos, tres. What's going on here? Right now we're putting the rail system underneath the reed boat right here and uh, we're sliding these rails under this a bed that will actually hold this whole uh, structure, the whole boat, and with the wood too that will go right into the water. So it's, we're getting close to finishing this off. So it's been a lot of work moving these several tons of rails around and banging fingers and toes and pretty dangerous work but we're almost done with it underneath the boat. Then what we have to do is cut all these poles out and drop it down on top of this, which is very dangerous. And then we'll, tomorrow we'll build the structure out front. We'll build a rail system that goes right into the sea. And Tuesday morning we'll launch this thing right out into the, uh, into the sea. The day dawns gray, and particulate mist falls over Camp Viracocha. Crews remove the walls so that the Viracocha too can get its first look at the Pacific. So we're going to be bringing the ship. It's going to be going into the ocean soon, we hope, but there's some gigantic waves. But the most important thing is that this ship is dragged slowly into the sea upon these gigantic rails, thousands of pounds of steel that's going to carry this ship into the ocean, hopefully safely, and that it won't be destroyed by the crashing waves. <sighs> The launch begins picture perfect, the bow of the ship sliding gently into the waves. All the ship needs now is a solid tug from a Chilean Navy ship waiting nearby. But the knot to the ship slips, and the Viracocha II wallows briefly, then slides sideways to the beach. Massive waves pound the ship as the crew struggles to save it. It appears as if we are witnessing the end of the expedition before it ever begins. About it, just for me personally, about 20 seconds, it was chaos. Uh, and then quickly I found out that we had to get the, the, the rope was not being pulled by the Armada. We were just getting stranded there on the beach and going to get pinned by the waves. And it was just going to destroy the whole project was about to just terminate right there. Um, and uh, so we immediately began working on getting the rope from the bow out to the Armada again, another rope, and uh, to pull it to, to get us offshore. Yeah, 
the crew on board the Viracocha 2 wait for the signal and begin to pull, hand over hand upon the line. When we were going in, I was on top of the mast, Panchuta, and then we went smoothly, but then they didn't, they didn't pull. So the boat started to go sideways, and then it got caught in the surf. And as soon as that happened, I went straight down and went on the other side of the boat. So if the waves hit it and we next, turn it over, we're next to each other on the other side. If you turn it over, you don't want to be underneath. Right. So, so we were waiting there a few times, but we had bad luck. There was a big set coming in of huge waves. But I was pretty impressed how well the boat held up, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. I told him the Navy said this. You need to move, it's going to turn. And I said, you know, this boat is not going to go flip. I thought, if we, at one no, point, I thought it was going to turn. I, I told them, don't yeah. worry, the boat is not going to flip. The only thing that I'm worried about is hitting against the railing. And it's, it's on the structural integrity the of the cabin yeah. and the masts and everything. I mean, I heard, I was holding on to one of the masts and I felt the ripped. crack. All the other side. Yeah, and the cabin like, twisted. Like, I mean, it got hit directly by a wave and basically just, I saw the entire cabin just like shift. Well, our rail system was perfect. We rolled right off, and um, just our, our tow boat just didn't pull. Just no, I don't know what happened. I still haven't got an explanation, and I'm waiting for that. And uh, we were floating perfectly in the water. All we needed was one little tug, and we would have went out ourselves. But uh, it just didn't happen. And then after a while, it wrapped around the, the track, and we couldn't get it off the track. Um, and it, nothing was happening. Just uh, very frustrating. Dobbers, what was going on there, man? Man, it didn't look like anyone knew what was going on. We were s scared. Very scary moment. The Viracocha 2 now sits injured, tilting slightly to the port side or left. Thankful that the ship is not completely destroyed, Buck estimates that the damage of today's launch cost the ship about two months of its life. For a ship only expected to sail effectively for six to eight months, this day may prove to be the determining factor in the success or failure of the Viracocha II expedition. But one man's dream has become a passion, and as long as the Viracocha II will sail, he'll be at her bow. On a positive note, the boat actually only one of the ropes is cut, and um, the re there's some damage on the, on the starboard side, quite a bit of, of the skin is, is kind of loose, but uh, it's nothing that can't be fixed. So that's a good thing. So we are still going to Australia. That's the nice thing. And uh, the crew that stayed on board did a tremendous job, really did, and uh, very grateful to those guys. Okay, Phil, so uh, what's happening there, buddy? Well, we're doing the last <laughs> the little um, details for the, the sailing. We're trying to work on the sails here, trying to get them rigged and up, up and uh, putting center boards in, loading the last supplies on. We don't have our food on board yet, so that's happening tomorrow. It'll be the last thing. It's a personal deal. But we've got about 10 more minutes of light, and we still haven't rigged the sails, and we're leaving in a day and a half, so it's getting a little tight. I really don't have much more time to come back out here uh, tomorrow on a Saturday, so I'm just going to have to hope this gets done on its own with other people because I can't really afford any more time out here, so we'll see. We'll see what happens, but I think we're going to just go out. We're going to get a tow two miles out, and we're going to finish what needs to be finished out there, just drifting. <laughs> That's what we have to do. <laughs> get the hell out of here. I'm tired of being in here. <laughs> we'll do it, we'll get it done. We're right on the way out to the Veracocha 2. In the, the uh, Chilean Navy Zodiac. And uh, we're going to do final preparations on board the boat, probably a half hour, and then we're heading to Australia, baby. <laughs> How are you feeling about it? Great. Finally, all, most of the work is done. It's been uh, five months of a lot of work, a lot of cash, a lot of struggle, but uh, we pulled it together as a team and we're finally going. I mean, the, 
first big part of this trip is over. Starting the voyage is the next, uh, doing the voyage is the next big part, the expedition. I'm really psyched. Now, more than a month behind schedule and two weeks in the water, the Viracocha 2 is finally ready to set sail for Australia with our intended first destination of the mysterious Easter Island. After a final inspection, the Chilean Armada tows us from shore. What are you thinking, man? You've been thinking about this one for a long time. You're finally out on the water. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, it's been a culmination of quite a few events that have happened over the last three weeks to get us to where we are. And, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's been such an accomplishment just to build the boat and get it in the water and, and now to think that we're actually at sea and living our, our dream and our, our um, the, the real test is in front of us. So it's quite exciting, quite exciting. Four miles out, we're on our own. Without so much as a day to relax, the first test arrives right at the doorstep of our voyage. It just wants to go right into the wind. It won't turn downwind. I'm trying just about everything I can to turn it. It just won't go. This is no place to be working out problems on an ancient style reed ship. But barely a day into the expedition, we come to discover that the Viracocha 2 will not or cannot sail in the right direction. Okay, we're going to reset this block. Just push down the top of that press. It. Say when. Yeah. Pokemon, a little bit more. Who have we to learn from on the how-tos of sailing such a vessel? The last people to sail a reed ship like this died over 500 years ago. This is the nature of the expedition, recreating a voyage of ancient mariners to discover if it was possible to sail between continents. Right now, we'd be happy to sail 10 miles. So any observations about yesterday? Or what's been going on that you want to well, trying to figure out, figure out how to make the boat sail, and um, it's, it, it doesn't seem to want to. It it just turns to the sideways to the wind, broadside to the wind, and, and pushes along with the wind instead of the bow turning and, and actually sailing. So we're trying to figure out why why that's going on. With the the rudder seemed to be working. We were under tow for a short period yesterday, and as we were under tow, we could turn the boat by just using the rudder. So that, that they seem to have enough service area that they will turn the back of the boat. But whatever's happening when we're not under, we're not being told, we're just trying to count on the wind, it's just not enough for the rudder to overcome the, the bow not wanting to turn down wind. So uh, Dean and I got in the raft yesterday at the Zodiac and took a couple spins around. And it, it may be that there's some problem with not enough sail forward on the boat to be able to, to turn the bow. This thing should just, without even a rudder or anything, it should just go downwind, just for flexing itself. An ancient style reed ship that won't steer correctly is definitely a dilemma for the crew. Expedition leader Phil Buck doesn't want to let on that we're having problems because we're under the watchful gaze of the Chilean Armada and seem ready to pull the plug on the entire expedition. Strange but true reed boat stories. All my nautical experience <laughs> tells me that something is very odd. <laughs> I've never seen anything like this and I can't figure it out. And when you stand up there and look, there's not much sail in front of that forward mast. Almost all the sails back behind it. And that's and that's in the midship area. So, you know, when you think about this thing weather cocking around, it, it, it sort of isn't there. And, and I mean, I know what you're saying, that it was how it was like the last one, but yeah. there's a lot of windage back here in this stern. And this, this is the same amount yeah. of space. It's just everything's wider, that's it. That's all we've done is widen things. It still should react to something when you push it over with the Zodiac. 
it should stay there. It shouldn't be coming back up. While we work out our problems, not only is there little wind, but the weather is oppressively dark and gloomy. And then, three days into the voyage, things get even worse. Two crew members, Steve Smith of Montana and Dean Plager from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, decide to leave the expedition. <laughs> Buck asks the Armada to give Steve and Dean a ride back to land, and in a dangerous nighttime transfer, they deliver us a replacement crew member, Eric Ott from Heath, Massachusetts. Very slippery, bro. Very slippery. Welcome aboard, buddy. All righty. Get up, yeah. What's happening? Yeah, baby. <laughs> How are you? I bet you never thought of this <laughs> one, man. Wild, baby. Don't tell him. Okay, hold on. A week into the voyage, Buck decides that the rudders need to be moved back as far as possible on the ship. What comes next is nonstop work to literally rebuild the steering bridge. So what are we doing? Well, our rudder or system is not working effectively. It, it works a little bit under certain conditions, but it's just not going to work. It's not going to get us to Australia, that's for damn sure. Um, so we're going to make a whole new platform back here. So we're just at the beginning of the stages. We'll have a platform the height of our original platform and um, crossbars and, and uh, we'll be tying in both rudder oars either on both sides or on one side or the other. We need better steering from further back in the boat, more leverage. Four days later, a Viracocha II first. A breeze catches the sails and the ship is actually moving in the right direction. As if in an instant, suddenly life is good and all our troubles have been forgotten. Yeah, baby. We fixed the problem. It was the um, center boards and lee boards on the front that were keeping it pointed into the wind. And the rudder oars were too far forward. Now we got those back. The little mizzen sail down was also hurting us, and also the, uh, the uh, front of the boards and center boards. Bolt, and now we got a Wumbo, a course of 250 now. That's what, that's what it's supposed to be doing, right? There. Nice! Very yes, slow, sir. but we're going. Now we're act it's, it's handling the way it's supposed to right now. Ah, yeah, okay. 250. Yeah, baby, it's working. Yes. Look at it. Look at we're moving now. Shit, it's Woo! Awesome. We're on the control. Working, Rafa's. Yes, there sir. There it is, Rafa's. Light wind, too. Look at this. Lightning speed here. We did it, Rafa's. Moving straight Rafa, back, buddy. Here we go. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. It's, um, we're, we're seeing some incredible sunsets out here. The, the nature, the whole environment is, is absolutely beautiful. We've been very lucky. Um, it's almost, sometimes I think we're tempting fate. We've been so fortunate. Um, I'm very pleased that we're making a lot more progress. We've got the jib cell up. Uh, we've at least added a quarter to a half knot to our progress per hour. Um, and I know for the whole team, given that we had a very slow start, it's it's quite uh, inspirational that we're, we're making good progress right now. So um, with that said, I, I think overall we're in a great position. We've had uh, great uh, luck so far. Um, it's been a heck of, a, of an experience and uh, looking forward to more. voyage of the Viracocha II, we push off from the security of home seeking out the antithesis of predictability. 
as if in the uncertainties of an adventure, with its hidden dangers and excitement, we may yet find some insight into the people that we are. Little did we know that the Viracocha II would offer us so many of these opportunities. The idea is to make it all the way up to Australia, or as far as the boat would go. So we're testing the, the, uh, the distances that these types of vessels could have traveled in the past. Um, it's in excellent condition. We've sank about four inches. We've, we're 30 days. This is day 30 into the trip. Um, as I mentioned before, we're not going as fast as I had ex anticipated. On the first voyage we went, uh, 2,500 miles in 44 days. Now we're going 925 miles in 30 days. So the certainly the, uh, the <laughs> we're not on the initial schedule that I had, I thought. But um, uh, basically, 50% of the time we've had little to no wind out here, including we spent almost six days near the coast just trying to get off the coast. So. So it's been just kind of waiting out for the winds. But when the winds are here, we're doing well. Do you like, you like it out here? It's like the tranquility of the sea. With a cigarette. How come you like it out here so much better than the Balsa Totora? Yes, because here you can relax a little bit. No noise. No... No I. It's the noise of the, the boat, you know? Mm -hmm. And you can feel all the ocean. It's perfect. But after 10 minutes, it's enough and you want to go back to, to on board. To see your friend and to see the red boat contact. It's the best contact I have ever been on board, you know? because you feel the ocean completely, 100%. What's going on in here, Eric? Uh I am planning on cooking a uh, nice uh, cream sauce with uh, a variety of vegetables. I think the crew could use some nourishment. We've had a lot of hard work to do in the last couple of days. have a long way to go, and uh, I'm just getting up my uh, culinary verve. We'll start off with some carrots. We'll do some, uh, some squash if I can find it. Nice garlic onion mixture. It's going to be wonderful. I'm certain. I'm confident this is going to be uh, cuisine par excellence. So now that you've got some fish, you're going to work that in. You're going to save that for dinner. I think we'll save that for dinner. Um, I think uh, we need a little time to prepare those. So we're going to go ahead with this dish first, and uh, I'll work that into this evening's menu. <laughs> Yes, sir. So 
what did you just do? Well, we just inserted a lee board into the side of the boat. It's to keep the, uh, the vessel from swaying to and fro. Uh, Rod created some knots down in the bottom with a thicker gauge rope, and uh, we're hoping they're gonna hold in place. Well, what was the problem? How come you had to do it again? What, what's going well, uh, on down there to make you have to do it again? Uh, there seems to be more pressure on the lee boards in the back, and also the edge of one of the lee boards uh, was sharp, so uh, we smoothed it off and uh, made some uh, thicker knots and uh, with thicker rope, and uh, it should hold now. Keep the boat from swaying and keep us on our course. All hands on deck is an all too familiar wake up call for the crew of the Viracocha 2. In the middle of the night, the winds change from the west to the southwest and the sails back up against the mast. Wakened from a sound sleep, a weary crew changes the sails. The winds have been appalling. Remorseless calm is a better way to put it. Our journal entries read something like, no wind today or we went 10 miles in the wrong direction today. We could wait till morning when the work is safer, but hazard duty will earn us a dozen miles, more than enough inspiration to get up. We did a sail change. The winds, after a brief uh, shower, have um, switched from the um, west to the southwest, so now we're able to sail a little bit westerly. Things are looking better. Kind of light to moderate southwest winds right now. A week later, we finally reached the 1,000 mile mark, cognizant that 30 days have already passed since our departure from Chile. We planned on a voyage of about 40 days to reach Easter Island, so the celebration is long overdue. Late that night, though, the sails back up again crew works from early morning well into the afternoon without a break. Yeah, it's just a, it's a tough time. Uh, we didn't get much sleep last night, haven't eaten breakfast, so um, we're a little bit grouchy, a little bit tired, but uh, we're going to manage. So, But uh, right now it's just a matter of uh, putting all arms you know, into it, all the muscles we can, and, and uh, fighting it. We learned right away that the business of sailing a reed ship is hard work. As we reset the sails, the ship refuses to turn downwind. So Felix Fischer of Germany, he rode for Harvard's national champion rowing team, puts his experience to work by literally rowing the ship back into position. 310, it's working. When we get out of this 30 degree window for steering, the sails start to back and then it's really difficult to bring the boat back on course. So about two weeks ago, I just put together a little oar, um, just to get to lift this beam here and a bit of pine wood and um, rig it here to the side of the bow of the boat. And then just about 10, 15 minutes of hard rowing actually turns the boat around and gets it back on course and the sails uh, on the right side again so what I'm doing right now is actually taking it off again because we are uh, on the right course again. Oye, ahí sí se mantiene casi en el 270, sí. ¿Cómo? Se mantiene más que nada en el 270. ¿Qué tú piensas de regreso de Isla de Pascua? Ahora que vamos a llegar a Isla de Pascua, sí, sí. vamos a llegar muy luego. Está bueno el viento, aquí ya no paramos hasta llegar a la Isla de Pascua. Uh, y, uh, el 30 la... vamos a llegar, dije yo. La fecha de ar arriba es... 30 para mí, 30 de, de abril, <risa> firmado. Y una cerveza para usted. <risa> Voy a ganarle la apuesta a todos. <risa> We lost the zucchini. Someone pitched it overboard. Who was it? Another mystery. Add that to the mysteries of the Veracocha. 
Let's see, we have a, someone had smuggled a Snickers bar on board and ate it and left the wrapper right on the gunnel. And what are the other mysteries? The toilet seat got pitched overboard or is missing or is hidden? I check under the tent up there. I bet you that's where it is. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Where's the zucchini? I don't know. I bet you that's where it is. <laughs> Overall world, probably. I bet you it's under the trap door. <laughs> I'm going to go on record that that toilet seat is in Jorge's tent, or Jorge knows where it is. Going on record right now. Jorge has that toilet seat somewhere. <laughs> Let's ask him on camera later and see what he does. Yeah, sure. No, no. The way, he's looking at me now. Oh, what you are you know talking? Why? Look. It's because Jorge. Tú tienes la la taza del baño. La taza del baño. Ah, sí. Tiene guardado en tu casa. been such a popular item and we're honing in to Easter Island and so Captain Phil decided that uh, he would dole out all the candy now and allow the people to equally regulate their intake according to their own abilities to uh, delay gratification I guess I should say. So we're dealing it out Everybody will get their equal share, and then the trading begins. It's a very exciting moment here on Vera Coach 2. And uh, so I'm almost done passing the rest of the candies out. Eight of us. Bueno. Los últimos del viaje. ¿Qué piensas de tu compañero de, de carpa? Sin comentario. Oh, man. Right now we're changing the uh, mizzen sail to the to a jib sail, a, a yardless, woodless sail up in the bow, so we can get more of the sail area up towards the bow, so we can cut into an unfavorable wind that we're having. And we are noticing that we cannot sail against this northwest or west wind, so we're trying to rectify that situation. So we've taken it down, and we're going to fly it as a jib, meaning a. a uh, yardless type of sail up in the bow, so we're hoping that we can point into the wind a little bit better. So uh, right now we're taking this yard, this wooden poles off the sail, and we're going to try to rig it up front. We're going to use part of it as a bowsprit, a part of the yard as a bowsprit that will allow us to fly this sail. Now, but it's it shows me that. Um, these types of vessels weren't necessarily just drift vessels that the ancient mariners could have sailed to any destination that they wanted if they had enough uh, sense about the boat. And certainly, this is our second voyage and we've learned a tremendous amount about what these boats can and cannot do. And most of the time we realize that they can do just about anything um, that they, you put your mind to it. So after generation and generation of testing these boats, I'm sure they knew 100% more than what we know right now. So I'm sure that these boats, these ancient reed vessels, could have sailed to any destination in any port in the world. Okay, un momentito. Boy, boy. Momentito, boy. I 
Uh, guys, listen, we, because we're in a situation with the food shortage, I think we're going to go ahead and get the spear gun. We've got a Rife International spear gun. We're probably going to pop him when we get close to the boat. We don't want to take any chances of losing him. Um, it's, to me, it's no different than a gaff. And to be honest with you, this is a, a magical reach ship voice. Things are crazy and nautical out here. We're going to just do what we got to do to land that fish. Wow! Yes, sir! Now you know why they call it a wahoo! Wahoo! wahoo. Tell you what, yes. it's never, never a dull moment around here. I tell you what, this has been an exciting day. We got a, about a 30, 35 pound wahoo that Stefan caught. We just pulled in a mahi mahi. It's, uh, I tell you what, we were just complaining that we were losing out on our provisions, having a ration. I tell you what, this is what, this is what the ocean's about. It's about eating. And this is great time. Great time. Take a look at what we got. Woo! Happy meal! Look at those steaks. This is wahoo. And this is about a 30, 35 pound wahoo, as we said. Take a look how thick that meat is. That is delicious. And not only to on top of this, in this magical voyage, we've got all kinds of cultures and, and attitudes on board. We've got our friends who not only is a great angler, but he's a dadgum great cook. And he can, knows how to fill your stomach. Great job. Look for Thank you. Well, it's day 56 on the Viracocha 2 voyage, and behind me, two of the crew members, Esteban and Jorge, are fixing the rudder oar. There's a crack in the shaft, which is a somewhat unfortunate development. The stress from all the wind actually cracked the shaft just above where the rudder oar itself was in the water. It shows you how much force is taking place beneath us, and uh, it's one of many, many exciting events that have taken place so far in these first 56 days. For me, I very possibly will be getting on board another ship, a cargo ship called the Aquamarine that will be passing our way in a couple of hours. Uh, my time has come to a close here on the expedition, some very pressing things taking place at home that has required me to take leave. Uh, it will be very difficult to leave the expedition. At the same time, uh, I think that after 56 days, I've uh, seen just about everything happen, except that one thing, uh, the summit, if you will, the site of Easter Island on the horizon. Can you look in that computer case up there and see if you can find that extra battery, dude? Yeah, well, first of all, we just passed the uh, very remote rock, uninhabited island uh, called Sale y Gomez, almost 2,000 miles from the coast of Chile. Uh, it is part of Chile. It has a, uh, at least one light on it. And uh, in 2000, on the Veracocha 1, we passed within six miles of this island, but we didn't really get a very good view of it. But this time, we got within three miles of it and saw it perfectly. Uh, but unfortunately, we decided not to launch our inflatable vessel to go up on it because the waves were uh, too high. They're, some of them are four meters high. And they've been building all day since early this morning. Uh, I just thought it was too risky to try to launch and go over there and check it out. But uh, we've got a pretty good sighting of it as we were going by. But it's been very exciting to me because I first heard about this remote island uh, through Thor Heyerdahl's books, and he talked about uh, a voyage that an Incan king did in a fleet of reach, uh, excuse me, of balsa rafts that went by this island, uh, possibly went by this island, on their way to Easter Island and further onward onto Mangareva, which is 1,500 miles further past uh, Easter Island. Nice to see some land after 
know, 70 days almost. And hopefully that's a good sign of things to come. Eager, all of us are eager to get to Easter Island after after all this. So hopefully after that we should uh, be in Easter Island in about five days because uh, we're definitely running out of food. What kind of tune it is, but it was a fight. My arm is exhausted. Um, we're about, uh, I don't know, maybe five miles off of uh, Sale Gomez, uh, most, one of the most un un isolated places in the world. As you can see, when it comes to fish, there's nowhere that escapes the boundaries of the territory of a, of a tuna. This is absolutely incredible. It's Otter's birthday today, and we're going to have us a feast, baby. We're going to have us a feast, and I'm excited to be here because this is the magical reach of voyage across the Pacific. Woo! It might be a yellowfin tuna. Check out his colors. The jubilance is quickly crushed by a storm only 90 miles out from Easter Island. It's all hands on deck to save the mainsail from complete destruction. The boat is taking a beating everywhere. Uh, the waves are washing over each side, up on each deck. It's pretty wild. This is uh, almost as big as the storm that we had in 2000 on the Barracocha 1, but the boat is taking much more of a beating. With poor wind conditions, 90 miles might take another month. In the kitchen, things are getting grim. We've got about a kilo and a half of lentejas, lentils, um, about 40 bouillon cubes, five potatoes, a kilo and a half of arroz, rice, Comfortably, without fish, we've got about three days of food. We got Phil's mountain climbing uh, stove here. Uh, it's been a little troublesome, so we've been doing a lot of troubleshooting to it. It's finally working good right now. Um, if, we, if this doesn't work, we're gonna have to start taking apart some of the decking to cook with, which could be kind of fun. Um, here's our propane down here. We already went through three of those. And we've been out of gas for about, I guess, about five days now, or probably about a week. Only a day of food remains, but on day 74, a vision of beauty appears on the horizon, Easter Island. It feels absolutely amazing. Um, the voyage itself exceeded all the expectations, I would say. And it's great, as you can see here, just behind there, the last point that we need to get around. Um, unfortunately, just now, um, one of the rudders came loose. So we're, this final stretch, we're just drifting right now and then probably gonna get a tow in. But it's absolutely amazing after 75 days at sea, just about double the amount of time that we thought it might take to finally get here and uh, we're thrilled. There was a time where I really thought that we might be over before we got really started. Um, so to have actually overcome those challenges and then it seems like uh, Neptune was just throwing one challenge at us after another. Uh, you know, a rip cell broken, uh, both of our uh, rudders uh, were broken. Uh, we had to build a new tiller that we put in the center of the boat. Um, lee boards breaking. Uh, port side listing, uh, some of the electronics uh, were, were, were uh, falling on us. Um, you know, the, against these odds, we're still here. We sailed exactly where we intended to go. It took us a little bit longer than we expected, but uh, that makes the accomplishment and the uh, expedition even that much more of a success. Bueno, bien. Gracias a Dios, estamos llegando, llegando sano y salvo. Pequeños problemitas, pero hemos salido adelante. Estoy contento porque aquí justamente habíamos cuatro, tenemos un récord de haber llegado dos veces a la isla de Pascua y más encima en una balsa y, y de Totora más encima. Así que difícilmente creo que un loco pueda eh, quebrarlo este récord. Gracias, Capitán. First thing I'm going to do is call my mom and 
tell her we're safe and sound, take that worry off my family, and then just do some walking, probably walk a couple miles, see some old friends, and just play it by ear. Look forward to doing some more work and um, continuing on the next leg of the trip, possibly. The first thing I'm gonna do when I reach the island is walk about 66 feet in length. You know, this boat's somewhere under 65 feet in length, so I'm going to take that one extra step just to know that uh, I'm really just going to savor the, the terra firma, just the uh, solid ground under my feet, and look around and, I don't know, just maybe grab a, a bottled soft drink. Uh, you know, Coca-Cola comes to mind right now. For the first uh, arriving, for my first touch in the island, I'm going to give a big kiss to the land on the port and after I'm going saluting and congratulating all the Easter Island people for their arriving and support us all during this trip because they were helping us by phone and by satellite and more than all uh, I'm going to give some news to my family, to my friend. As far as reaching the island I'm extremely excited and happy that uh, the, for the second time we were able to, to pull this off. It's one of the most difficult voyages in the world. Some uh, modern sailboats have difficulty reaching the island, but uh, um, never mind in a reboat. Just about everything uh, you can imagine uh, has gone wrong, but the strength of our team has carried us through. It's been an amazing journey with the uh, seven other crew members. Uh, it's been incredible. A Chilean Navy boat hitches up to the Viracocha 2 to tow it safely into harbor. Within minutes, the winds shift and blow from due west for 10 straight days. On this voyage, nothing has come easily. Buck is faced with the wrenching decision of what to do and chooses to end the expedition on Easter Island. While this expedition has fallen short of its original goals to go from continent to continent, the Viracocha II has successfully reached Easter Island, something no other modern-day mariner has done in an ancient-style reed vessel, and Buck has done it twice. Yellowtail kingfish, baby blue shark. Say the word tuna, it's like an angel's harp. Viracocha dose, Viracocha dose. Rocking and a reeling on Viracocha dose. Got a rod, got a reel, a million fish are swimming. Toss a baited line and I hear the bells are ringing. Viracocha dose, Viracocha dose. Rocking and a reeling on Viracocha dose. a frigate bird. That's the mating call too many of the frigate bird. Too many activities after school, it looks like. Oh. He's obviously very lonely. He went to Connecticut or Vermont too much. <laughs> I think he was stuck in the woods a little too long. Yeah. <laughs>